Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are so excited for you to join us for this session today. Um, this information is so important, and we are just so thankful um, for Dr. Valkoff for presenting. So with that, I'm going to hop off the screen, and I'm going to let you begin your presentation. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank Taka. I am very honored and gratified to be here with all of you with Taka today. And I'm very excited to share information with you. 45 years ago, I was actually delivering babies 24 hours a day at UCI Medical Center in Irvine. By the way, you're at the right session, but I was delivering babies 45 years ago. When I was a child, my dad was one of the first infertility obstetricians in the United States. We lived in Atlanta. He became very renowned for infertility. And every year for over 35 years, he had patients that would have to wait six months to come see him. They come to Atlanta and they're pregnant before he even treated them. What happened was the referring obstetrician would say, I can't help you. There's a miracle obstetrician in Atlanta. He cures infertility. You must go see him. When they heard that information, they relaxed. And the way the hypothalamus pituitary regulates the reproductive system normalized. Now, certainly not every case of infertility was healed that way, but my dad had at least 25 cases a year for decades that worked that way. So when I was a child growing up, it was dinner table conversation that the brain and body work together. The mind definitely can influence the body. So my interest in medicine as a kid was the mind and the power of the brain. So today we're going to, I, oh, obviously I changed my medical career 42 years ago, pretty dramatically. I uh, love delivering babies, but my passion and destiny was what we're going to talk about today. And we first started treating ADHD. And then back in the mid nineties, a mother called me and says, Dr. Velkoff, you helped a friend of mine's son who had ADHD really helped him a lot. I want you to treat my son with autism, with neurofeedback. I said, you know, I really would love to help you, but I have no experience in using neurofeedback and treating autism. This is the mid nineties. But when she described her son, he only spoke in two word sentences, but he also was hyperactive, impulsive, and couldn't focus. He had all the core symptoms of ADHD as part of his being on the spectrum. So I told her, I said, look, I don't know if we can help his autism symptoms. So let's do this. It's normally 50 treatments for autism spectrum disorder. Back then, today it's 42. Let's just do 20 treatments and see if we can at least improve his core symptoms of ADHD, not the autism. Before he got to 20 treatments, this child was speaking in seven word sentences. Well, that opened it opened my eyes and opened the doors where we could now start helping autism. So this started back in the mid nineties with autism. And since then, we've been through many evolutions of technology, brain mapping, neurofeedback, even neurostimulation. So I'm gonna share with you uh, in this brief session, what I have learned. And please, uh, I'm happy to help you with any questions at the end. So let's, let's get started now. With autism, you know that there can be GI issues, there can be inflammatory processes going on, there can be biomedical deficiencies. All of those have to be addressed and treated successfully. But ultimately, we still have to go back to the brain because the brain is where it all starts. Your brain controls everything. It not only controls your physiology, your body, but it also, as I learned from my dad's work in infertility, but it also controls itself. So. Even though there are GI issues that need to be addressed, biomedical issues, inflammatory processes, we're focusing on the brain today. And we utilize the brain's capacity to form new connections in the brain using through the process of neuroplasticity. If you're 80 years old and you start learning a foreign language, your brain is gonna develop new synaptic connections through neuroplasticity. When in childhood, neuroplasticity is, is greatest. Now, through neuroplasticity, the brain can change itself. It can rewire itself in a much healthier, more functional manner, which I'm going to explain. 
And neurofeedback, it's also called, back in the 1980s, uh, we called it EEG biofeedback. Then when quantitative EEG brain mapping came available, it began to be called neurofeedback. It's based on operant conditioning. We're rewarding healthier brainwave activity that we want to see more of. The child is rewarded visually and auditory. And we're ignoring brainwave activity that is that is dysregulated and abnormal. We're only going to reward the positive brainwave activity. And I can summarize neurofeedback to you very, very easily. If the brain is able to see the results of what it is doing, it can change its activity and it can begin to regulate itself in a much healthier, more functional pattern. That's the essence of what we do with neurofeedback. And there are four different types of brain waves we look at. Delta waves are the slowest brain waves of all, one to three to four cycles per second. You produce delta when you're, de you're in deep sleep. Theta is also what we call a slow brain wave. It's four to eight cycles per second. Theta, you're drowsy, daydreamy, unfocused. Ever had an experience where you're driving on the, on the road and for about five minutes and suddenly you don't remember the last five minutes, you're probably driving in theta. Don't drive in theta. But that's, that's, that's what theta is like. Alpha is another slow brain wave. If you close your eyes and relax, your brain should go into alpha, particularly in the posterior part of the brain. When you meditate, you produce a lot of alpha brain waves in the back part of your brain. Your brain is in an idling state of relaxation. So delta, theta, alpha are very slow brain waves. They're very important in certain times of day. Theta and delta are very important when you sleep tonight. Alpha is very important when you want to relax. Now, beta waves are 12 to 30 cycles per second. But beta waves, 12 to 18 cycles per second is optimal. You're calm and focused. If you're producing a lot of beta brain waves, 20 to 30 cycles per second, your brain is overstimulated. You're probably going to have anxiety, irritability with children. They have tantrums, meltdowns, or you'll have trouble sleeping. So these are the four types of brain waves we look at. And we look at two aspects of the brain functioning. One is we want to make sure that you're producing the right proportion of brain waves. You don't want too many or too few of any, any one type of brain wave. Think of the concept of a muscle, your bicep muscle. You have to lift up an object. Your muscle needs a certain amount of tension to contract to lift up that object. If there's not enough tension in the muscle, you can't use the muscle to lift up an object. That would be analogous to very slow brain waves. If you have too much tension in the muscle, the muscle is going to overcontract. It's going to go into a cramp or a spasm. It's also dysfunctional. So think about we don't want too many slow brain waves nor too many fast brain waves. We want everything to be balanced. And children with on the autism spectrum have abnormal brain wave activity. They have never experienced what normal brain wave functioning is like. They have no reference point of what normal is. When a child on the spectrum does something impulsively, inappropriately. Even a child with ADHD does something impul impulsively, inappropriately. I want you to understand that they're behaving normally for their brain. That's the way their brain has always worked. So when you criticize a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder, we're talking about autism right now, they're not going to have very good insight into why they're being criticized because they're behaving appropriately for their brain but maybe their brain is not filtering and pausing impulses, or they have very low tolerance for emotional regulation. Transitioning can be very threatening to them, and they go into a fight or flight reaction or a meltdown. So the way they're behaving is normal for their brain, but their brain is not regulating normally. They don't know what normal is yet. Neurofeedback is gonna provide information to their brain of what more optimal normal functioning is. So they can begin to do that more and more. And when they get rewarded for it, the brain wants to do more of it. Now, I, I want to show you, uh, this is like a, a little bit more than four minutes. It shows you the actual procedure of brain mapping. That's the brain map cap on the patient's head. There are 19 areas that we record brainwave activity from. And then you're going to see a patient doing neurofeedback where the brain map cap is on their head 
and they're working on improving the connections in the brain. The biggest problem with brainwave activity and autism is the connections in the brain are very dysregulated. The different areas of the brain are not communicating appropriately. So you're going to see first, after we show the brain mapping, you'll see neurofeedback where he's improving the connectivity in the brain. And then at the end, you'll see neurofeedback on the surface of the head where we're training the arousal level of the brain to have the brain at the appropriate arousal level. This is the first step in our treatment of autism spectrum disorder. We're recording the electrical activity of the brain and we're seeing what's called the EEG on the screen in front of the patient. Our brain only weighs several pounds, yet it uses up 20 to 40% of all the body's blood glucose is utilized by the brain to create electricity in the brain. And that's what we're recording on the EEG. Once recordings are completed, it's then processed through a normative database. And we're monitoring and recording 19 channels on the head, and you'll see 19 rows on the computer screen. This EEG data is then again processed through our normative database, comparing to patients the same age who are healthy without symptoms. It helps identify if any areas, regions, or what's called networks of the brain are dysregulated that's linked to the patient's symptoms. We then develop out a customized neurofeedback protocol based on this recording to help the brain move to a healthier and healthier function. Once we complete the recordings of the brain waves, then we analyze it through the normative database. And the results show here that this patient's brain is stuck in a very abnormal slow pattern in the central portion of their brain. This pattern is analogous to your brain is offline. It's not processing information. We want to help the patient shift the brain and reduce that slowing into a more optimal functioning state. That's why the brain mapping is so critical. We wouldn't know where to treat or how to help this patient without knowing where the problem was. We've analyzed the patient's brain map and we've created a customized neurofeedback protocol to help this patient improve their brainwave activity that's gonna improve brain functioning. The EET recordings are connected to a brain computer interface that converts the EEG into a video game with auditory and visual feedback so the patient is learning how to improve brain activity that will improve brain functioning. In autism spectrum disorder, it, there are abnormal functional connections in the brain that, that produce symptoms. It diminishes brain functioning. In the brain map analysis, we can look at 11,000 plus functional connections in the brain. We then see if any of those connections are not working normally that are linked to specific symptoms the child is experiencing. The patient can then learn to improve brain activity that will improve brain functioning. When the cheetah is moving across the screen on the top row towards the right, and you hear a bell go off, every second that occurs, the patient is now producing a healthier brainwave pattern. We want to get the brain out of the abnormal state it's in and start having it develop into a much healthier functional state. And that's what the feedback is telling the patient. When that sheet is moving across the screen, whatever you're doing in your, in your mind, keep doing it, it's working, it's working. You do this over and over and over and you will significantly improve functional connections in the brain, which will reduce symptoms. This is the other type of neurofeedback we do in treating neurodevelopmental disorders, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD. The brain doesn't know what normal is. And in the autism patient, the brain doesn't know what, what normal is. If we give the brain more information about how it's working, it can use that information to work in a much healthier, more optimal functioning pattern. So again, the electrode is recording his brain waves. It's connected to a computer brain interface that converts his brain with activity into a computer game that he can work with. Every time the fish jumps in the river, an auditory tone goes off and he gets a point on the screen because he's producing a healthier brain wave during that moment. If the fish does not jump into the river, there's no auditory feedback. He's not being rewarded. So he's only being rewarded when his brain is working in a healthier pattern. 
literally increasing the size and numbers of synapses in the brain that improves also connectivity in the brain that create a much stronger, healthier brain function.